Thanks. So thanks everybody for joining. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out today. Um, from our past webinars on this topic, it's been extremely rewarding. So we're, we're expecting this to be just the same. Um, so first of all, my name is Dan Sullivan. I'm the RVP uh, for the East Region. Uh, and typically it's with any person or technical difficulties. So sorry about that, but uh, glad to be here. Uh, but we also spared no expense today uh, to bring you uh, Mr. Gary Kwan, otherwise known as GQ. GQ is our is conducive senior vice president of technology strategy. Um, he's only been with the company probably around 32 to 34 years. I'm sure GQ, you'll get me the right number there. But GQ, glad to have you join us. Uh, good to be here, Dan, and uh, good to be here. And yeah, that's close enough. 30, 34, 35, anywhere around there. That's long enough. But uh, <laughs> be, uh, be here to go in the deep dive on the technical issues and to keep the sales and marketing guys straight. But honestly, though, Dan is very technical savvy, and he doesn't need me, but I'm here to help out and glad no, to thank be here. Thanks, GQ, and wouldn't do it without you, and, and folks, he does keep me honest. A couple of just of administrative things that I do want to mention. Um, first of all, there is a, uh, the, what is it, the Q&A box, GQ, that we want to yes. use? Yes, there's a Q&A box over on the right-hand side, not the chat box, but the Q&A. And we like to make this session very interactive. So if you have questions during the sessions, please type it into the Q&A Q &A and direct it to all presenters there so we can all see it. And we'll either get to the questions during the session or we'll wait till the end to handle them all. So uh, stump us with questions, please. And, and folks, don't hold, don't hold back. Um, Again, all of these sessions have been extremely interactive, a lot of great questions, um, and that's what we're here to, to, to talk to you about, is how to get 2x faster SQL performance through a software solution that will do that on your existing hardware. No hardware to buy, pretty amazing. And also for, for sitting through and bearing with us here for the next 30 minutes, you'll all receive uh, a full license copy of Velocity, an NFR, not for resale copy, copy server license, single VM server license that you can install. Um, and you'll, you'll see about our dashboards, et cetera. And hopefully you'll connect with us after you've got it installed so we can talk to you about what you're seeing on the dashboards. So look forward to that. Um, so, so if we could here, folks, um, just want to briefly talk to you about conducive technologies. You may know us from a past life as a disk keeper corporation, but uh, we've been in business and Gary's been here almost since the inception, 37 years, 12th oldest software company in the world. Uh, but we are the preeminent uh, IO reduction software company in the world. Uh, disk keeper in the past used to focus on defragging physical drives, but in around 2012, you know, the world changed virtualization came upon the scene, uh, you no longer defrag a SAN or an SSD, and GQ and his team brilliantly respawn the software. So now we are all about preventing, not necessarily defragging, but preventing fragmentation from occurring in the Windows OS, which leads to, along with another patented filter driver that GQ and his team have put together, leads to anywhere from 30 to 50% a reduction of I.O. to your back-end storage, which in turn our customers are seeing anywhere from a 50 to 300 plus percent application performance improvement, even in all flash environments. So pretty dramatic just for installing a piece of software. And oh, by the way, there's no reboot now required to install the software. It installs in minutes, and you're off and running on the optimization trail. Because of what we do, Gartner, whether you like them or not, they named us a cool vendor, said we should be installed in every virtualized initiative. From an OEM standpoint, the folks you see here, HP, Dell, Lenovo, Western Digital, Samsung, 
they all OEM the patented caching engine. So that's a second piece of our software. Uh, and they put them in their laptops uh, because it's it, because it's so intelligent and fully automated. Uh, it just optimizes I/O and has their machines running as as best as they possibly can. And you can appreciate the testing that they would have put us through to then OEM that software from us, put their own name on it in some way, shape, or form, and install it in their machines. From the decades of work with Microsoft, we're a close partner with them. Because of what we do in virtualization, we're a close partner with VMware. <clears throat> and GQ and his team just recently qualified us under the, the, a recent, recent certification called the Microsoft SQL Server I.O. Reliability Certification. And GQ, you want to chat just a little bit about that with the folks? Yes, Dan, thanks. And I consider this a nice elite certification. You know, Microsoft has certain certifications to make sure that third-party products are fully compatible and reliable with theirs, and in this case, SQL Server. And not only did we have to go through some strange testing, we also had to go against a board of SQL uh, you know, experts at Microsoft and uh, pass that. Now, we're the only we're the only software solution to get this certification, but we're in good company with people like HP, Dell, EMC. So it just shows how well we work with SQL here, Dan. Absolutely, GQ. And again, congratulations on that. So folks, even Microsoft's telling you that, that it's okay to install us in your SQL environment. And we're going to give you some more reasons here as to why you should be doing that. You know, as being so focused on uh, I.O. and I.O. performance and have been since our inception 37 years ago, we also do a lot of surveying of the industry and folks like yourself. And we've been doing surveys every, every year, over 1,000 IT professionals with a variety of questions, but one happens to be, what are you seeing? What performance issues are you having in your SQL environment? And I'll tell you, over the last five to six years, the number of organizations that are demonstrating or talking about slow SQL performance has been growing. Uh, this year, it's at 28% of the folks saying, yes, I've got a problem with SQL. And quite frankly, the more we talk to folks, we probably would expect that number to continue to grow. And interestingly enough, Seven out of 10 of our new customers, new, new logo customers that we bring on, initially buy our software to boost their SQL environment. And this little word diagram here is all of the different you know, words that come through on the surveys. And you can see what the, what the center point is. It's all about SQL and SQL performance. So again, excited to be here and, and sharing what we can do for you. You know, virtualization has been great for server efficiency, but it's been horrendous for I.O. performance, and that's also true in a SQL environment. Whether it's a physical environment or a virtual environment, our software is going to improve performance and improve I.O. performance. What you'd like to see here, and this is really depicting the most efficient I.O. environment possible, you'd like to see large contiguous writes coming out of the Windows OS, hitting the hypervisor, moving down to storage, and back again. And again, this could be, you know, a, a physical box just going to storage and back again. But again, this is the most optimal and most uh, and the fastest environment possible. But with virtualization, two uh, performance degradation environments enter in, and one is the Windows I/O tags, and the other is the I/O blender effect. And GQ, you want to chat with the folks a little bit about these two inefficiencies? I could do that, Dan. Uh, on the Windows I.O. tags, this is, uh, this is actually the Windows operating system here. And what it does is... Hey, GQ, this is Don. I think you need to move your uh, headset down. You're right, Don. Sorry about that. <laughs> is that a little clearer? Anyways, yep. Uh, yep, on the... Windows OS, it tends to break apart the I.O. into small random I.O.s. 
And the reason it, instead of doing it in nice sequential IOs, now, the reason it does that is the file system takes a one-size-fits-all approach. It doesn't know when a file gets created or extended how big it's going to be. So this is all on the logical side on the Windows OS. It looks for the next allocation. And the next allocation may not be big enough to fit that file. So when it fills up that allocation, it, fill, it looks for another one and so forth and so forth. So rather than writing the I.O. in a nice sequential I.O., it writes it out in a many small random I.O.s. And that's the first, uh, first performance issue. The next performance issue is that you then have all these random I.O.s going down through the hypervisor. Of course, then that gets all broken apart from, you know, the different VMs. And then you have this term that, uh, that we help Gartner coin called the I.O. blender effect. And now you have all these not only small random I.O.s, but now they're not getting put in order either. They're getting randomized going down at storage. And how this hurts performance is not only on the band, you know, on the operating systems having to do hundreds of IOs rather than 10 IOs for a single file, but also down your storage. If you ever get storage, they give you two benchmarks, one for uh, sequential IO and one for random IO. And the sequential IO always outperforms the random I.O. So if we can enforce nice sequential I.O., we're getting the best performance, not only going down through the bandwidth, but also you're getting the best performance you're getting out of your storage. And uh, so that's what I have. That's a quick and dirty explanation of this, Dan. And I yep. notice, uh, yeah, I'm hearing some screeching every now and then. Um, on the speaking, and I'm not sure if that's me or you, Dan. Okay, GQ, well, thanks. Okay. Um, and so, uh, um, as GQ mentioned here, if you were going to write a gigabyte of data in this scenario, and by the way, this is true of every virtualized initiative, doesn't matter what you've done from a hardware standpoint, these problems exist. Whether you have all flash, hyper-converged, et cetera, on the bottom, it's all just, it's just a cacophony of I.O. here. And so if you went to write a gigabyte of data, uh, this might take 100,000 I.O.s. With our software optimizing the I.O. environment, it may only take 50 or 60,000 I.O.s. So you can appreciate what that really means from a performance uh, standpoint. So where do we sit, folks? So as I mentioned, we are two light filter drivers. We install in the OS, again, with a recent announcement or a recent enhancement, excuse me, last April with GQ and his team, and they worked on this for years. We now install in the OS without a reboot being required. You could literally download our software, install it, and be up and running within 15 minutes, and the longest time it takes you to do any of that is the download. And you'll see that when you get your NFR license. But again, we are, if it's compatible with Windows, it's compatible with us. We're above the hypervisor, servers, HBAs, network, and whatever kind of storage you have in the back end. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, we see folks, even on all flash environments, because of these issues, so even if it's all flash here, we see folks getting 50 to 300% application performance improvement just by installing our software. So really just pretty dramatic improvements. So as I mentioned before, you know, what is it we do? We deliver large contiguous writes for more payload with our IntelliWrite patented filter driver, our patented caching engine, which is extremely intelligent and fully automated, there's nothing for you to do, uses idle DRAM to cache hot reads. Those reads were right next to the OS, and as you know, DRAM is 10 to 15 times faster than anything on the planet, even Flash. 
So by serving up those reads from DRAM, you can appreciate the speed that that is all occurring in. As I mentioned, we have a new dashboard that shows you what it is we're doing. We, we coined the term years ago, set it and forget it software. We beat the Ronco chicken guy to that. But that's what we're all about. And so creating these dashboards, GQ and his team, they now demonstrate what the software is doing for you uh, in a very visual fashion. And we guarantee to solve your toughest performance problem or your money back. And I tell you what, we haven't gotten, haven't had to do that yet in our environment. So what are the two patented filter drivers I've been speaking of? One is in Telerite. Uh, and the other is in telememory. And GQ, you want to chat with them about these two patented filter drivers? I can, Dan. And the first one is uh, in Telerite. And, you know, I mentioned before how the <coughs> system doesn't know, you know, what size when a file gets created or extended, how big that extension or creation is going to be. So it just looks for the next allocation. But we're doing something fairly simple here. We're actually monitoring your system in the background. So we can, we know when a certain file type or a certain application, when it creates or extends a file, it's going to be so big. And we just feed that intelligence back to the file system. So the file system, rather than looking for the next allocation, looks for the best fit allocation. And what that means is, it can put it all in that one allocation, and that file get, gets written out in a nice sequential I.O. rather than a whole bunch of small random I.O.s. And, of course, this, and reading it back, the same thing. Rather than having to read it back in many small I.O.s, it reads it back in a nice sequential I.O. An analogy I like to give on this is, you know, if you've got to deliver a gallon of water from one place to another, do you do it with a whole bunch of small Dixie cups? or you do it with one big gallon uh, bucket and do it all at one time. And that's what we're enforcing here. So you get this nice uh, performance gains with this technology, Dan. Thanks, GQ. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the second patented filter driver uh, is our read caching engine. That's what's also OEM by, again, you remember folks at the beginning of HP, Lenovo, et cetera. Uh, and that, again, you, is very intelligent, it's very smart. It's not looking at the big blobs of data, but it's, it's, it knows what, which IOs are performance degrading. And it's those that it chooses and, and, and will realize it's not a first in, first out, last in, last out. It's extremely intelligent. And because of that intelligence and because of its automation, there's nothing for you to do to get uh, the benefit of this, with just having three to four gig of idle DRAM available, um, we can produce incredible I/O reduction and performance improvements in your environment. GQ, and you hit upon it, Dan. And there's basically two unique technologies here. The one you indicated, what, how we determine what, and to keep in cash for the best benefits. You know. Many caching products, they, uh, something gets read in and it says, oh, let me put this into the cache and hope it gets read in again. Well, we're not doing that. We're looking at the long term here. And we know what data is tending to get read the most. And that's one factor. The other factor is what data in the cache do we put in there to give you the best performance gains? And as Dan indicated, it's not those big, long reads that are hurting performance. It's actually those small ones, those small random IOs, those what we call noisy IOs. And if we can satisfy from cache, what that means is right there on the system with, from the application that creates an IO, we can satisfy that those reads right there. And that prevents having to go down the network to the storage to satisfy those reads. So we just cut down on all that traffic there. Now, that not only saves performance on that single machine, but we just increased your bandwidth on that network and that storage because there's less traffic from that one machine there. So other machines, systems also get the benefits. 
Now that that's the first one. The second one is how we use memory. Uh, unlike some other caching products where you say, I need to allocate so much memory for my caching. We're very dynamic. We'll only use what's available out there. And so what this means is any only we'll only use a memory that isn't used by the system or user processes. And if the system user processes need the memory, we automatically give it up. So there's never any memory contention issues. So dynamic use of memory and what we determine to put and keep the cash for the best benefits is what makes our uh, our technology here unique, Dan. And uh, before I pass it back to you, Dan, I'll tell you I can hear I can see some good questions coming out, and we'll we'll get to them shortly. No, oh, thanks, GQ, because I was going to make sure people you know make sure that they asked. No, we've had to stir up some some good questions. I would hope by now. So, but thanks for letting me know that. Appreciate it. So, folks. Those are the two patented filter drivers that are in our software. If you think about it, it's fairly simplistic. It's like taking half the cars off the highway at rush hour, packing the remaining cars full of people, and putting you all in an HOV lane that actually works. You're just going to get home faster. So that's another another little analogy of, of what it is we do. And that's just one part, Dan, and that is, you know, the Intellirite technology, because now rather than a whole bunch of small random IOs, we got we pack it all and do nice sequential IO. The other one is a caching, where we satisfy that right there at the system, so we don't even have to put it on the network. So it's kind of like we're allowing the people to work from home, so they don't even have to get on the highway. So there you go. Nice analogy. Thank you, GQ. So folks. Um, you know, we have a whole, we have thousands of customers using our software. This is just an example of a few customers that are actually some case studies that we've done. Uh, but besides saving a customer a $2 million storage upgrade, and I won't even spend a lot of time on that, look at the lower left here, Bill Mobility. They're the, they're the Verizon of Canada. They installed us in their environment. And look at what we did. We reduced I.O. to their SAN by 61%. And what did that result in? 3x faster SQL queries. I mean, ASL marketing, batch imports dropped from 27 hours to 12 hours, a 15-hour reduction by taking 10 minutes to install our software. Creative Office, response times for SQL and others are 90% faster. And you can see some of the others here. It's just, it, it's dramatic what we do. And the more read intensive your environment, the even better the improvements will be because of that caching engine and the use of idle DRAM. Here are some more customer examples. And I, you know, you can read them faster than I can talk about them. But I'll just mention one here, the University of Illinois. Uh, they were a disk keeper customer. They installed us in their brand new all flash environment, build big Dell 730 servers, 768 gigabytes of RAM, a new compellent flash back end. And this is the results of a 72 hour before and after test uh, running a certain Oracle database. It, and it took four and a half hours to process the data, 13.9 million IOs to storage, and it was about one and a half petabytes of information. 72 hours later, after installing our software, the four hours went to an hour and a half to process the data. 13.9 million IOs went to 2.7, and we did all of that after processing another half a terabyte of data in the hour and 30 minutes. They were just amazed because they had just installed all this new gear, new flash environment, running faster than it had before, and we just took them to another level. And while I mentioned to Greg Landis that that was great and, you know, he could now sweat these new assets longer, he kind of looked at me and said, you could, but what you've given me, Dan, is you've given me all of this headroom here by reducing this I.O. to allow me to add more applications to this existing environment. I've spent all my budget, and now I can add more to this without having to spend more money extremely happy and it's a great case study as 
as all of these on this page and others are. This is just a quick example of what the dashboard looks like. Um, there, there are multiple pages behind this, but for example here, we've eliminated uh, nine and a half million IOs uh, over the last three weeks here. And of those nine and a half million, seven million are read IOs, 2.4 million are write IOs, and the the algorithms do uh, some multiplication around the IO elimination along with your average latencies to deliver to you what those IOs being eliminated mean from a storage IO time save perspective. You know, so in this case, we've saved 20 hours of storage IO processing time by eliminating those nine and a half million IOs talking about fragments prevented and eliminated, free spaces consolidated. And as I mentioned, as you can see up the top on the left there, there's more tabs for you to dig deeper into what it is we're doing for you in your environment. GQ, any comments here? Uh, Dan, the only comment I do have is that this dashboard shows the performance on each individual system because it's actually gathering the data and the latency uh, rates on your system. So we know when we eliminate that I.O., what the latency would be for that I.O. to complete. So that storage I.O. time save is what is actually being saved on your system there. Great, thanks. So folks, you know, how can we, you know, how do we guarantee 2x faster SQL performance? One, I mentioned, you know, available DRAM. Again, 10 to 15 times faster than anything on the planet. It's certainly a lot less expensive today than it was in the past. So uh, one is to just to ensure that there's at least three to four gig for us to use. And depending on the size of your application, you know, the, the amount of available RAM can vary. Another best practice, and exactly actually also a Microsoft best practice, is to appropriately cap SQL's max memory. SQL will take all of the memory uh, if you let it and leave nothing for anything else to use, um, which would negate then our automated DRAM caching engine. So by capping SQL at an appropriate level, and you can actually kind of walk yourself down that cap by what, by looking at the dashboard and seeing what we're doing as you as you move the uh, the SQL memory cap down, and maybe a little counterintuitive, saying, "Oh gosh, I don't, I, I'm not really going to take any memory away from SQL. It, you know, it needs all it can get, but it, it really doesn't, given what we're providing on the backside with this DRAM caching uh, benefits to you. And as I said, you can see it from the dashboard, and then you can just add more memory if possible. So the next steps here. One, as I mentioned, we're going to send you a NFR copy of our Velocity software, uh, a, a per VM license worth $525. Um, so you, thank you for sitting through and, and listening to uh, GQ and I talk about this you know, phenomenal software solution for your environment. But the other thing is, um, depending on your environment, you may have multiple VMs in a host environment, as again, thousands of our customers do, uh, each VM creates its own inefficiencies from an IO standpoint. And so what we recommend to customers is to install us on all the VMs on a particular host. That way you eliminate the noisy neighbor effect that you can get and you're optimizing, you're providing each VM to be the most optimized you can delivering in total then the most optimized environment possible. You could have seven VMs on a host, optimize two, but the other five are creating all of this noisy I.O. that actually degrades and take away from the optimization that you provided on those other two VMs. And we're happy to work with you. We're happy to let you have the host license, uh, the velocity management console to manage the environment for you. It's really easy, as I said, no no reboot, installs in minutes, uh, and you're off to the races. So with that, GQ, I'll turn it over to you to see, uh, you know, if there what questions we've got. Sounds good, Dan. Uh, let's start with Kevin. He, This is more of a license uh, 
question. He says, for the single server license, can this be utilized on a VM running SQL Server, for example, and then move to a different VM at a later time? Should the decision be made to put it elsewhere, for example? And he doesn't mean run them simultaneously. Uh, and yes, Kevin, that's no problem. Uh, it, it's meant for uh, one license, and you can run it on ACE, one system you want. Not simultaneously, though, so no problem on that. Uh, let's see here, what else we got? And oh, I got one from Jason, and this is good. What happens to the data in the unlikely event of a power failure to the server? Is it is a cache to DRAM data that needs to be saved to disk lost? Uh, here's a good thing. good question, Jason. And data integrity is uh, one of our you know number one issues here, or number one goals. And we we have our cache is only a read cache, a read only cache. So what's in cache is already out on storage. So there's no loss to any data integrity because uh, you know the power goes down, the data that's in cache is already out on storage. We're just satisfying the reads from the cache there. And let's see here. And then we have another one from Jason. Does IO blender effect occur if you have dedicated drives per VM? And Jason, yes and no. If it's truly a dedicated drive for that VM, then you will not have that IO blender effect. But if you if it's something like let's say a LUN on a SAN, okay, uh, and there's other LUNs going to that SAN on another uh, VM or another physical system, then you do start to get that sim a similar thing like a IO blender effect because you still have uh, uh, all these IOs going to different lens but all to the same SAN. I hope that makes sense there. And uh, let's see, Robert asked, uh, how about an uninstall? Does that require a reboot? And no, with the latest versions that we have, Robert, uh, install or uninstall do not require a reboot here. And let's see here. And I just want to add there too, GQ, again, working with customers every day, you know, we used to have to wait for, you know, your reboot windows to to open up. And that could have been could be from a month from now. And in some cases, a lot of healthcare was a lot of every quarter. So now it is just so simple to install and so quick and easy. GQ, what you guys have done is amazing. Thanks, Dan. Then Raju says, how does Conducive works with Azure Cloud? And, you know, you got a infrastructure as a service or a platform as a service. You can put it on that system and get that same, uh, those same benefits from that. And here's another, here's another benefit. Uh, you know, depending on your environment, and again, everybody's environment is different. So we can talk about one customer and, and somebody else is going to experience something slightly different. But uh, two things. One, the testing that GQ did for the SQL certification was done in Azure. Uh, and in that environment, I believe we, we probably improved performance around 30%. This was on non-flash you know, non uh, drives or backend or storage. So the nice thing about our software is in cloud environment is you very uh, almost almost guaranteed you could you could implement a lower cost tier of cloud storage with our software and get the same or better performance and save money at the same time. Of course you'd have to test it, but that's what customers are seeing using our uh, IO reduction software. And you might think, uh, Raju, how's that done? Well, if you think about it, one of the charges they do is, you know, how much I.O. is going to the storage, and you get charged for that. Well, if we can eliminate or reduce the number of I.O.s that have to go to storage because of caching, we now reduce that I.O. footprint that you're going down to storage. So we'll reduce the cost that way. Okay. Then... Uh, see, Brian had this good question, which you answered a little bit here, uh, Dan, is 
since SQLite take as much money out of the system as possible, how does a caching get optimized? And you're absolutely correct, Brian. Uh, SQL likes to load all its databases in memory, even though some of those databases never get access, or parts of those databases never get access. So what we do recommend is uh, limiting SQL and on the, how much memory it uses and give us a little bit of that so we can do it with the caching and take full advantage of that memory. And we've, you know, we've done some, uh, had some outside lab do some testing on that and saw, uh, for instance, transaction rates go up 60% by us uh, allocating the memory and being able to use it with our caching product. And then Harry asked, how does this affect other applications that are not SQL? And Harry, good question. You know, in, in this session here, we, we talk about SQL. But it's actually, the reason we talk about SQL is because it's very I.O. intensive. Any system or application that are I.O. intensive is really our sweet spot. So file servers, exchange servers, uh, all those other databases too, not just SQL. Uh, uh, are our sweet spots and where we help out. So good question there. Uh, Wayne asks, how much RAM needs to be set aside for this software to run? We like to recommend that you have, <coughs> excuse me, Wayne, you know, at least, I'd say four to six gigabytes of available mem memory there. Now, this, and why I say that is we always, you know, I, I said we only use available RAM, but available memory there, but we also, we always leave at least a gig and a half always available. So let's say there's two gigs available on your system after, you know, the system uses it and so forth. We would only use a half a gig of that because we always leave at least a one and a half. Now, so that's why I said, you know, it's nice to have four maybe six gigabytes of available RAM to get that advantage. Now, if it's not there, let's say there's only two gigabytes or three, we'll take what's ever there and give the, those performance gains. And if there's none available, well, you won't get any of the caching benefits, but you still get the other benefits, the Intellirite benefits and the other uh, performance technology that comes with velocity. Uh, Ralph asks, have you tested software with Rutherford EO Star? And Ralph, I'll be honest with you, I, no, I have not. Uh, but I have to tell you, we're agnostic to the applications. We're agnostic to the, uh, you know, the hypervisor. We're agnostic to the uh, type of storage down there. All we're looking at is, are these Windows, is this a Windows platform? Are these Windows IOs? And we're, you might think of us as, we're just optimizing the Windows IO. So it's still a Windows IO, but optimized. Is it compatible with fail, failover clusters and availability groups? Yes, it is. When you fail over, you just have to have it installed on both systems and it will just start running on the other system. Otherwise, if you don't have it on both, it just doesn't, uh, it just doesn't start running on the other one, but we do rec recommend having it on both systems there. And Brian, how will this impact SQL cache hit ratio settings? We actually do not do not uh, recommend or any changes, uh, you know, on those settings. It's uh, on those settings itself. Uh, and so that's on the cache itself. Where we're actually just looking at I/O within the file system itself. So there, uh, we have not seen any changes on that that we had to make there. Let's see here. Dal, in a VMware environment, is the extra RAM for caching needed for each VM? And uh, Dal, yes, we're looking on each VM. What available memories on there, not what available memories on the hypervisor, but what on each system. Where we get installed at, and this is, might be another question here, where do you get installed? 
we get installed on each VM, not at the hypervisor, on the VM running Windows. So that's where we're looking for the DRAM. Uh, Jason asked this question, and I don't know, Dan, but you, you may have because you work with the University of Illinois, is how much DRAM was dedicated to that SAT soft, software platform? And yeah, GQ, I was, uh, I was actually trying to go back here and look at uh, for some of their dashboards, which I just haven't located yet. So the, I'm going to say the answer is I don't know. But, yeah, again, you used the term, uh, or you at least mentioned dedicated. Um, I guess I would probably say how much were we using because, again, as GQ mentioned, there really is no dedication here of the memory. The patented uh, caching engine that GQ and his team have developed, uh, memory will actually ebb and flow. Uh, if the OS needs memory that, that we're using to cache, uh, it'll automatically flush the cache and give it back to the OS. So I, I can't specifically answer your question. I apologize. Uh, but again, it, since it's so dynamic uh, uh, an allocation that, um, you know, it, it, it'll use what's available, but it won't necessarily even use all of what's available. And, and I'm going to say in most cases, when there's extra memory, what I've seen on our dashboards is there may be, let's say there's 20 gigs free, we might use 10. We always, in a lot of cases, it seems like we, we really kind of, for some reason, end up using around, you know, half of what's available. Um, so can't specifically answer your question, but those are some observations I've seen. Okay. And let's see, Angela had a good question. It says, in SQL, any change that brings us good performance also has a catch. With your product, we get better ah. I.O., but is there any down issue in performance for installing your product? <laughs> you know what, Angela, I I would say no. Uh, uh, there's things that we put in there. It's kind of like, you know, you want the cure. You don't want the cure to be worse than the problem itself, and that we're very careful on that. In fact, is, uh, a lot of things we do in the background, like trying to determine you know, what to put and keep in cache. We always run that at lowest process priority. In fact is, we put, besides running at lowest process priority, we also put in something we call Invisa tasking, which is we also go and monitor the resources. And even though we're running at that lowest process priority, we see that what resource is being used and if things are being used, we'll go to sleep and wait for that. The only thing I do see is little that I may point out is that you need some available RAM in order to do, you know, to get the caching benefits. If you don't have any of that, then you don't, you won't get any of that. And by um, the way, the dashboard will actually show you too whether um, you need more RAM uh, for our software to, you know, to be a benefit, more benefit to you or not, because some of the there's a there's a tab we didn't show that shows memory utilization, uh, and GQ has actually added some some uh, physical identifiers, so the numbers might turn yellow if you could use more, or they'll turn red if there's even not enough memory for us to use. Yep. yep. And then Joe says we also use a progress database, and I assume it will help regardless of the type of database. Is that correct? And Joe, you are correct. Uh, you know, talk about SQL here, as I indicated, just because SQL is very I.O. intensive. And Oracle database, we're on that. So we're just looking at, you know, very I.O. intensive type of systems. So we're, and we're just working on the I.O.s itself there. And see, Henry, is it, Henry asks, is it, hey, I got to tell you, Dan, we got some good questions here. Not a great question. So these, this is a great. very good group. I love it. Henry says, is it possible to get a quick analysis of IOs? How it will make a SQL instance better before actually purchasing the license? Well, there's two things here, Henry. You're going to get a free NFR here. You can put it on the system and see the benefits without having to purchase, you know, a license for that. But then once you see that, you, you may want it on others. 
Uh, but I would and, we'll, and we'll work with them, GQ, to to put it on others too for you know for thirty days or so and see what happens. Well, I was just going to say that, Dan. You know, Dan mentioned about we give you one free NFR, but they also recommended putting the trialware version on all the other systems on that on that same host. And I will tell you here. There's a couple of stories that we have had. Uh, where the user put on one system and saw some benefits, but then we had them put it on all the other systems in there. And that what that does is we talked about that. We talked about that blender effect. And just by putting it on one system, you still get that blender effect from the other systems. Uh, but then after they put it on all the VMs, that 30% went up to 60, 70, 80% gain. So uh, we do recommend trying to put on the VMs there too. Let me see if I, I got speed up here, Dan. I got to keep up with these guys. <laughs> uh, this is compatible on bare metals, right? Yeah, This as long as it's a Henry, as long as this is a Windows platform, you can, it, it'll, it'll work on there. And Kevin, perfect for POC and trial purpose for me. Thanks. You're welcome, Kevin. Sean, if the tool aggregates I/O on the server side, what are the storage requirements? Uh, right here, uh, Sean. Uh, I'm thinking uh, there's not much storage required for the product itself. You know. It installs. It, it'll probably take a what uh, a megabyte to uh, install the product. Uh, the caching is occurring in in the memory itself. So uh, there is there is very little. Uh, actually, there's you know there's really no storage requirements to. Uh, for this product itself. Uh, there is some data that is kept on, you know, what what is kept in cache and what put in cache, but it's very small. Nothing nothing outstanding here. Uh, Gary says, what OSs do you support? Uh, anywhere from uh, 2008 R2 uh, up to, you know, the current uh, Windows Server 2016 and we're uh, do it testing on 2019 right now and uh, don't see any issues but we need to continue that then on the desktop Windows 7 and, and up to uh, the current Windows 10 here. GQ? Yeah. Excuse me for interrupting but I, I was able to go back and find the University of Illinois dashboard here that talks about memory utilization to answer that question. So for just for what it's worth, it was a 60-40 read-write ratio that they had. And again, this is what the dashboard will show you. Out of the 768 gigabytes of memory, 426 gigabytes were free. And we were using 161 gigabytes of the 426 gigabytes free to generate those type of results that you saw before. So that was even less than half of the free that we used to generate those results. And this this uh, this was also on a, uh, they had uh, in that environment that I spoke about. So excuse me for interrupting, but I did want to answer that question. I found the data. Well, thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Yep. Brian says, so you mentioned a host license. Do you mean VM or is there <clears throat> license model installing on all VMs on a host? That is providing compute for multiple VMs, like a data center, sure. data center license model. I'll pass that one over to you, Dan. Thanks. I caught the football here, GQ. <laughs> so, so, uh, so yes, we do have two licensing models, and but you're right. The host model, uh, if you have seven or more VMs on a host, it's, it's the most economical you can do. But yes, it covers then all of the VMs on that host. There could be you know 10, 20 whatever the number is, versus the per VM model, the server model, where it is on a per VM basis. 
Um, we have some customers that might have a host that only have two to three VMs. Then the per VM per server license is more economical. Seven is the break even on those. And then you're you're in the in in the dollar signs with more than seven. Got it. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Uh, Shane has a good one and and he caught on this one. This is good. What about the right cash? In order to combine rights, you must be caching the rights as well to combine them before sending the request to the disk. Therefore, I'd re-ask the question about data integrity on power loss. What happens to our rights? You know, Shane, a lot of people think we must, exactly what you think, and, and rightfully so, that we must be caching those small rights and then, uh, then writing them all out at one time. We're actually not doing that. As I indicated, we're just giving intelligence back to the file system. So when a file, when a file crate or extension comes into the file system, it knows how big that file write or extension could be. So rather than finding just the next allocation to put it, it goes and finds the best allocation to write it out. And that best allocation is large enough so it can put it all in at one time rather than breaking it apart. So we, we as I said before, we really don't have a right cache. Uh, uh, but a lot of people think, oh, that's how you must be enforcing these large right IOs. No, we're just giving intelligence back to the file system so it can do a better job. I hope that answers that question for you. Uh, Jason, if cache is read only, how does it optimize the write and contiguous I.O.? Uh, just answer that, Shane. Uh, Jason, I hope that does it for you. But we got a good uh, – this group knows what they're, what they're talking about on the systems here, Dan. This is good. Yep. How does this fit into cloud deployments? Safe to assume there will be gains within a Windows-based SQL Server VM. And, uh, Ryan, you are right. If it's an – Infrastructure as a service or a platform service, you can get us, you can install us on those uh, Windows based systems out there on those cloud deployments there and get those things. Since it's so easy, you just try and see what happens after a week or so. Yeah. And let's see, oh, Kevin here. Uh, how is a DRAM cache handled in replication scenarios? What is the impact, for example, or how does this work with the reads? Continue your answer to the other DRAM question about rights. And let me go with that. And it says also to add to the replication SQL Server setups, multiple VMs. What about SQL Server clusters in general as well? Can you elaborate on software and how it helps performance in these type of setups? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Kevin, actually, we're just running on each individual VM, okay? So like on uh, the clusters there, so we're running on theirs there and just looking at the IOs on those systems. And it's not as though, uh, and it's over time, and you know, we're mine is the system looking at the IOs over time, what to put in the cache uh, to get the best benefits. So we're kind of agnostic to these replications uh, so it, it, it actually works fine in those in environments there. And then Brian, can you cap conducive memory use? Would there ever be a reason to do that? Uh, I would say, to be honest with you, Brian, uh, 95, 99% of the cases don't have, you just let it uh, run as is because it will just use what's available there. Some, pe some applications we have found want more, always want that. They, they won't run unless there's that much already available. You know, we have, we run in those applications. So we will then cap the conducive memory use, or we'll always say at least always leave it this, this much memory on the system before you use any. So, we, and you can do that. So, good question there. Uh, Dow says he has lead. Can you send him a 
copy of the presentation, and Dan, I believe everyone will get a a uh, link to the presentation after the meeting. Correct? Yep. Yep. Hey, then Kevin, one last thing on my QA, I think, based off of other statements I've heard, can you share the CPU impact of the OS and writing this in conjunction with SQL Server, and also the memory increase overall, say on a per server basis when running this? Two things we have seen, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> we've actually seen the CPU increase, and not because of what we're doing, because now the applications can do more work. One of the things you'll see on the dashboard is uh, the workload, and what that is is the amount of data being read and written back and forth from the storage. And what we've seen is applications doing more work. Uh, there's something called Iometer. It's a benchmark. And if you run Iometer with and without us, you'll notice that Iometer now, and we have it set to run in the same amount of time, you know, let's say uh, and run 10 minutes. Now in that 10 minutes, it's doing twice as much and almost sometimes two and a half much workload uh, in that same amount of time. And that causes, well, there's more CPU being used. But it's not us impacting CPU, it's applications doing more. The memory increase overall, it's hard to say because it's, it, it varies on the applications. But we do see if it's available there, nobody else is using it, we will use it there. And if, it, and if it's giving you benefits. Uh, let's see here. Brian says, are there any plans to support Linux distribution? I'm glad you asked that, Brian, because we, we can bring that uh, back to the development team. Uh, as we get more and more demand for it, we are looking at putting the same uh, technology onto Linux, but not yet, not right now. Would it help SQL jobs like CheckDB, which are really <laughs> IO intensive in nature? If it is, and this is from Ranjot, Ranjot, if this CheckDB is highly IO intensive and it's also doing a lot of repetitive reads on the same data, then yes, it will help. But if it's something like, oh, it's reading the whole volume from one end to another, no, it, you know, to be honest with you, and I'm on the tech side, it's not going to give you that as much benefit there. Okay, let's see here. I lost my and you can the Linux piece is though, and understand, sure, it's, even if SQL is running on Linux, but if it's a mixed environment, uh, because we end up optimizing the Windows side, which it's which by its very nature is very fragmented and unoptimized, generally everything runs faster. Yes. And then Robert says, if I install this on my test SQL environment to test it, am I then able to install and use the same license on my production SQL server? Of course, uh, absolutely, Robert. Be glad for you to do that. Uh, Matthew, wouldn't the end these files themselves still become fragmented? Yes, they will, Matthew. Uh, actually, you know, this uh, thing to write out the I.O. in contiguous matter, that is, that is preventing the fragmentation from occurring in the first place. But it doesn't prevent all fragmentation. We've seen it prevent anywhere from 60 to 85 percent of the fragmentation, but there still is some. So the product also will do fragmentation, but a lot smarter now. It's not just going to go out there and just defragment things just because it's fragmented. It looks for things that causes performance issue. If a fragmented file is never getting access, we're not going to spend the resources trying to defragment it. If the fragments are large pieces, that doesn't cause performance issue. We're not going to uh, spend the resources to do it. So, yes, uh, they do. Some will still get fragmented, and this product will still handle that too. 
There are different versions for SSD and spinning. Uh, this is from Jason. And it says, will SSD version also optimize the physical hard drives? Yes, in both versions, Jason. It actually goes and it texts, is this an SSD or is this a hard disk drive? And applies different technology or what we call different engines depending upon that uh, disk type. Uh, this is both on Disk Keeper SSD and Velocity. Then, Matthew, so can this run on the host as well, or should the disk file sizes be pre allocated? Uh, two, there, I think there's two questions here. First, can this be run on the host? We, right now, we, this is set up to run on the VMs. And the right way we're doing that is on the VMs are the applications running, and that's what is creating the IOs, and that's where we can cache those right there and satisfy them. And the second one is, should the disk file, disk file sizes be pre-allocated? Uh, you can do that, and you know that will cut down on uh, those small random IOs, but when you do that, it also uh, takes up more disk space too, but it, that will that could help. But uh, it, that just takes up more disk space because uh, a lot of those in those cases, a lot of those uh, pre-allocations you're not using there. Okay, Dan, I think we're about at the end of it here. Trying to keep that's awesome, space. Jason. I do just want to add too that you know SSDs do not like random I/O. So the more that we can eliminate all of that random I.O. from whacking on those SSDs, we then mitigate issues like write amplification, wear leveling, and garbage collection on the, that degrade performance on an SSD. So, um, so we – go ahead. Sorry, GQ. And Dan, also on SSDs, they give those same two benchmarks, random I.O.s and sequential I.O.s. And the sequential IOs outperform the random IOs on SSDs too. <laughs> Great. No, well, th well, thanks everybody. I, you, I get the prize uh, for awesome questions and being so engaged. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to take myself out of my sales hat here and say, look, try try the software. It's simple to install. We're happy to connect with us. We're happy to give you a host license to try. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we want to help you, you have your environments run more efficiently, better, faster on your existing hardware. And uh, believe me, our, uh, our software can deliver for pennies on the dollar versus a hardware solution which doesn't solve the I.O. problem that you saw earlier. So. That being said, uh, any questions, reach out to us. Um, we're, we're happy to dig in and help, uh, and, and we're looking forward to engaging with you. So, GQ, again, thanks for keeping me honest here. Thanks for running with all, most all of these questions. So appreciate it and for your comments during the presentation. Thanks, Dan, and I, I, I do want to appreciate the group. I know we went past past an hour, past a half hour with all the questions and appreciate the ones that stayed on. And I hope, uh, you know, I'm not a salesperson, I'm the tech guy. So I just like people putting it on there and seeing the benefits. And uh, I, I hope that you can try it and get some great benefits on this. Thanks, Dan. You're here. So great, well, thanks everybody. Look forward to working with you. I uh, hope you have great holidays. They'll even get better by using conducive software. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Right. Happy we'll holidays. We'll talk soon. Take care. Bye.